everybody. Since early day, humanity used to face security attacks. This attack performs not by brute force, but by smart people that know how to trick the system in order to gain some profit for themselves. Well, the first event that are known are actually coming from the Bible, Genesis 27. This is the story about Jacob, Esau, and Isaac. When Jacob presents himself as Esau to Isaac, his blind, dying father, in order to gain his birthright blessing, he basically performs what we call today an, event, an act of identity theft. Fast forward, in 2016, more than 20 billion dollars were lost due to the different forms of identity theft act in the US only. And more than 110 billion dollars were lost globally to the different form of security attack. That means that 3,488 dollars are lost every second. This is crazy. Now everyone knows that human nature is not that great, right? So people for many times, and still today, used to keep their strategic asset, their valuable, in vaults and in locked doors. What would happen is that in the past 30 years, everything changed, and digital assets started to displace physical assets. In fact, today, there is more digital market money around the world than paper money, and this trend still continues. Think about the next generation drug that is developed by Pfizer. Think about the financial records of a company traded in Nasdaq. All those assets are digitized and kept in computers, and they're worth billions to their owners. So the rumor was spread around, and a new form of crime was created, which is called cybercrime. And actually, since I started my talk, more than $400,000 were lost around the world due to cyber attack. So since nothing changed in the day of Jacob and Esau till today, does that merely mean that we are going to live with cybercrime till 2037 and beyond? Is cybercrime a force of nature? Well, in the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss that to forecast the future of cybercrime and even try to pinpoint the one thing that may change everything, but most likely will not. But before we start our journey, let's look what are the main four main fundamental elements that drive someone to perform cybercrime. The first one, of course, is the personal gain. The second is the low obedience level, or if you want, the desire of a person to keep the low despite the fact that he is tempted to gain something. The third one is the success rate, or if you want, what are the chances of not getting caught? And finally, the penalty that he gets. Now, the two first parameters, personal gain and low obedience level, they can group together. Because when the personal gain is very high, more people will try to attempt to gain it. The second parameter, the success rate and the penalty, can also be grouped together. Because once more, when the penalty is low, more people will take the chance, even if getting them may have high risk. So those four parameters can be grouped nicely in one simple formula that predicts what is the incentive of someone to create cybercrime. It's called the ICC factor. But another way to look at it is to look by the ratios. When you look at gain versus obedience, this is basically represent us, our human nature. People that have bad ratio in gain and obedience are called greedy people. The other two parameters, success and penalty, together represent the risk. The risk that we take when we do such act, and the risk level is actually dictated by law enforcement rule. So now, the problem is that in digital world, in our today world, all those four parameters have changed, but change in the wrong way. And let me explain. If you look at the game, if everything is digital, now people can try to attack and gain some new types of gains that in the past did not exist. You can gain political gains, you can gain social gains, and of course financial gains. With more options, more people will come in and try. And what about the law? Well, the law in the digital world is not so clear. Think about a hacker that writes in a blog some false information that creates riots somewhere. Is that okay to break to this website and change the content? Not so sure. And when people are not sure, they try. And what about the success rate? Well, if a hacker can attack us from China, other side of the globe, what are the chances that they'll get caught? Quite slim. And finally, the penalty? 
well, when was the last time that you've seen someone going to jail for 20 years before because of, he, he did something in cybercrime? Not really. So the ICC factor today is relatively high, and the incentive is very high to more and more people to try and to gain something out of doing that. So no surprise that it's booming. So now that we know what are the fundamental things that push the cybercrime, let's start our journey to the future and try to make the first step with looking at our defenders. So security experts very quickly realized recently that when a hacker steals your user and password and use it in order to get into the system, from the computer point of view, they look exactly like the genuine owner of the key, combination of zeros and one. And when you cannot determine who is the good guy and who is the bad guy, what do you do? You have to change approach. And in the, in the last few years, since 2015 or so, security experts stopped for trying to identify people by their keys and tried, started to do that through their behavior. And here, for the first time, they start to get great help from an amazing area, which is the area of artificial intelligence. With artificial intelligence, security experts now can identify the bad guys based on their behavior because their behavior must be very different than the behavior of the genu genuine owner of the key. And artificial intelligence can help them doing that in, even if the changes are slim, tiny, or unexpected. And once more, let me give you an example. Let's assume for a second that the hacker gained access to your bank account. When he logs in and tries to transfer money to himself, he will most likely type his commands in different speed than yours and he'll even put some different pressure on the keys while he's doing that. In two years or so, an artificial intelligence solution will be able to detect it in real time and stop you. So in three to five years from now, any security solution around the world will have some component of artificial intelligence. So does that mean that artificial intelligence is the cure? Unfortunately not. Because if a machine can determine what is the behavior of a human, how it looks like, there must be another machine that can try and find a way to fool the artificial intelligence machine and defeat it later. And indeed, in 2025 or so, we'll start to see artificial intelligence machine controlled by hacker attacking system that also protected by artificial intelligence machines. And the ones that will have more computing power and more persistent will unfortunately win. And that's where a new generation of solution will emerge. Solutions that are based on virtual reality for digital world. Now think about it, the idea is very simple. If you have digital assets that are kept with, within digital vault, right? Why don't we use virtual reality in order to copy it, to create 100 copies of the same vault and hide it somewhere? And have all the other 100, instead of the genuine data, have trapped there? And if computing power is so, uh, so cheap, why not doing 1,000 clones? Now attackers that will try to get in and hack into the system, once they are in, they'll have to figure out which is the right door of all the others. And if they'll pick the wrong one, they will be captured. Well, we have to assume that this solution will work for a while. But somewhere around 2030, hackers will start using deep machine learning, independent learning, and finally they'll figure out how to crack it. And this is when the next generation of solution will come up. This is what I call constant displace uh, uh, virtual reality. Now, once more, the idea by itself is relatively simple. If we have one true vault hidden among 1,000 others that are false, and the only thing that can disclose it is its actual location, its address, why not changing this address constantly? And why not turning this vault into a moving target? And indeed, in those kind of solutions, all those th thousand instances that we discuss will switch places all the time. What's right now worth a million now, a few seconds later will be worth nothing and actually will be a trap. In 2037, a secured environment will look like multiple mazes that keep on changing location and shape with thousands of doors where only one leads to the right place and the, the rest to nowhere. And the attackers, on the other hand, will look like an army of shadow soldiers trying to figure out which is the right door out of all the others. In 2037, if my predictions are right, is a world where there is a constant war, war between machines. And for every dollar spent on innovation, there's at least one more dollar that is spent on protecting it. 
It doesn't mean that it's a bad world. It just means that billions of dollars are going to a non-productive protection uh, methods. And that's not the great thing to do. But in any way, that's, that's it. So the question that remains, is that really our faith? Is it really a force of nature that will survive and live forever with cybersecurity? Well, when you ask such a question, fundamental question, you have to go to the basic. Remember my formula from previously. We already agreed that gain and obedience represent us, our human nature. That's not going to change, not now and not in 100 years. So in order to fix the issue, we really have to treat the other side, the risk side. But before asking yourself what we should do that, let me ask you a simple question. If someone breaks into your home, steals something, what do you do? You call the police. But if someone steals your credit card and uses it, what do you do? Do you call the police? No chance. Every day, every minute, thousands of people, bad people from all around the world, hackers, invade into our home, into our businesses, take the, what they want and leave back. And by the way, since I started my talk, 1.6 million were already stolen around the world just like that. So the question is not what should we do, but why is it that nothing is done? Once more, the answer is very, very simple. Recently, government realized that with cyber war, they can achieve more with less casualties than they can achieve in the traditional war. A tiny virus can go and destroy an entire nuclear plant, something that 20 years ago will require the risk of 100 planes, pilot, and even a war. Furthermore, governments realize that with cyber war, they can actually attack the infrastructure of their enemies the banking system, infrastructure, and weaken them. So today, in cyber war, governments are using the same tools that gangsters are using in cyber crime. And when we are asking our government, hey, protect us, what we're actually doing is that we are asking them to use the same ammunition that they use today in the war to protect us. And when they'll use it, they will show the others that they are immune. When they'll show the others that they are immune, the enemy will get it and create new countermeasure, and that's a risk. Governments today prefer to sit quiet, bear the cost of cybercrime, and keep their weapons secret. The new war is a cyber war, and unfortunately, we are the collateral damage in this war. And if nothing will change, that's how it's going to stay. And I did say if. So if I said if, there must be a cure. There must be a hope in here. And the hope and the cure, from my perspective, will come from very traditional government politics idea and our ability to influence it. We are the taxpaying people. We are the one that can go to the government and ask them to take care of ourselves, our family, or our businesses. We are the ones that vote for them and can ask them to put our security on the agenda. Ask them to balance our request for security, better security, with other requirements and find a solution for us. And they can. And if they will not do that, what will happen is that all of us will find ourselves in this war zone and, and the private sector will be crashed under the human, huge cost of protecting itself. We don't want to be there. Government must take action and take part, its, its part in the right side of the equation. Now, it's not a perfect solution. I know that. People will always find a way to do some bad things, but this is the only solution. Unfortunately, I don't know if the government will take our call. I don't know how government in 2037 will look like. I don't know if government will survive the next 20 years or not. I am not uh, an expert in the area of government 2037. But I can definitely tell you that this is a great topic for the next Roma. Thank you very much.